For Americans, the name Benedict Arnold is synonymous with betrayal. He's remembered as a vain and vengeful Continental Army officer who betrayed his country to the British during the Revolution. What many don't know is the role his wife, Peggy Shippen, played in his treachery. Though Arnold proclaimed Shippen's innocence to his dying day, Shippen not only introduced Arnold to British spymaster John Andre, historians have discovered that their seemingly innocent love letters to and from the front lines contain messages in code and even invisible ink. It seems Shippen was not just the love of Arnold's life. She was, in essence, his case officer. The stereotype of female spies is uh, femme fatale, using their feminine wiles and charms to entice secrets out of infatuated men that they really they shouldn't be sharing. The reality of women um, in espionage uh, doesn't really match the image that um, I think a lot of people have. They were as serious as men. For the most part, they did not use their sexuality to seduce the enemy, but they often use their femininity. If you mention female spy, I'm sure that 99% of people will say, ah, Mata Hari. And why? Well, because she plays into all of the stereotypes that have come up before. I mean, what was her day job? Her day job was an exotic dancer. Oh, there you go. There's using sexuality for you. So when I hear the words femme fatale, um, you know, I understand that, that there were women who acted in this capacity uh, at certain points in history, to a certain degree because it wasn't expected that a woman would be out trying to get intelligence information from the powers that be. And that just by the virtue of surprise that she could be successful where perhaps, you know, a, a man might not be able to. But unfortunately, I think in popular culture, it's often been spun up and made a bit salacious, where her only ability to get that information has been through using her, you know, sexual wiles or something like that. There is a big difference between women using their sexuality to get what they want and their femininity. Sexuality means you have sex or you use man's carnal desires to get what you want. Using your femininity means that you're playing on their stereotypes of you as a woman. The more important thing about female agents isn't necessarily that they're these kind of seductive sex objects who are going to get males to do their bidding, but that rather they're very often just sort of the, the people in the background who by being ignored by not attracting a lot of attention and therefore go about the business of espionage with less scrutiny and in some cases more success than a male might be able to achieve in the same situation because the male would be immediately suspect and the woman would not. So women spies performed an important role uh, in the American Civil War uh, as well. Some carried secret messages in the hoops of their skirts. Other hosts of uh, uh, grand dinner parties perhaps listened in to the conversations of politicians and, and military commanders. Women's servants uh, were important operatives in the American Civil War uh, as well. Uh, a, a black maid in the household of uh, the Confederacy's Jefferson Davis, a young woman by the name of Mary Elizabeth Bowser, passed a number of important secrets to the Union during the years of the war. It was generally assumed that she couldn't read, that she was illiterate. So Davis left various military dispatches lying around the household, which Bowser read and then passed their contents over. So Harriet Tubman um, had herself escaped from slavery and then helped a great many other slaves do the same, including her own parents. Uh, this, well known, I think, is the espionage role that she performed after 1861 for the Union uh, against the, uh, the Confederacy. 
She had great knowledge of Southern geography because of her growing up there and, and then her work on the Underground Railroad. And she continued to move around the South even as the war was raging, collecting uh, information. But her role wasn't just confined to that. She actually uh, was involved in military operations as well. In, I think it was 1863, she helped plan and then actually lead a Union raid in Confederate territory at the Combe River. Kate Warren was an employee of the Pinkerton Agency. In 1861, just ahead of Abraham Lincoln's inauguration, she was in Baltimore, uh, where she detected chatter, if you like, about an assassination plot against the, the president-elect, against Lincoln. He was going to be killed when traveling through Baltimore and changing trains on his way to his inauguration uh, in Washington. Now, Warren took on Lincoln's protection. She got him a disguise uh, and a false identity uh, as her brother, as an invalid, and um, took him under a blanket across Baltimore uh, onto uh, the train to Washington, uh, where she sat with him all night throughout the journey, awake, guarding his well-being. Given the fact that a secret service protecting the president didn't exist at this point, it might be fair to describe Kate Warren as America's first secret service agent. If I was going to pick my favorite female spymaster, certainly from World War I, it would be Elspeth Schreugmüller. Or if she was better known, and there are a couple of fairly, you know, potboiler movies, I think, with this title, Fräulein Doktor. She came from a good German family, um, and she was one of the first women in Imperial Germany to actually earn a doctorate at a German university. She offered her services to the fatherland during the First World War and was initially employed as an intelligence analyst in one of the main German bases in occupied Belgium in Otberg. But eventually she proved her value to her male superiors and she then began to run an agent training school in Otberg. And she gave background training in terms of field operations, uh, tradecraft techniques, but also, apparently, quite importantly, the psychological aspects of, of what an agent would need. And so here was something that was different from what you would have seen before, that Elspeth Schreigmuller was a woman put in charge of agent training, and most of her agents, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority of them were, were men that were being used. Elspeth Schreigmiller served her country during the First World War and then sort of returned to academia in the 1920s. She came on the scene, she played an important role, and then sort of faded, I mean, in, in effect, because a peacetime society had no particular use for a woman of her talents and experience. Now, I was great as, in, as you know, training agents during the war, but now it's the Weimar Republic and we're not doing that sort of thing anymore. Uh, the Nazis seem to have had no particular use for her, uh, and thus she, she comes and goes, but became this kind of mythical figure. Mata Hari's, that was her stage name, uh, really as a spy was, I have to say in my opinion, was pretty much a bust. I mean, I'm not sure she ever accomplished anything of any value to anybody. And really, she's a, she's a kind of tragic figure. She was bouncing around Paris. Keep, now, keep in mind, she is living in France, sometimes going to Britain, other countries. The war is on. She is a foreign national. She is Dutch. And one of the things that meant was that she could move between France into the neutral Netherlands. She had an exploitable advantage in simply in terms of her nationality. She was also a performer, which gave her a reason to move from one place to another. It was the French who initially tried to pressure her into working for them. And she is in some way sort of coerced. She had, she had fallen in love with a Russian aviator. 
And the French intelligence chief, Ledoux, said, look, if you want to sort of meet with your boyfriend, you're going to have to work for us. Uh, we need something from you. And what we want you to do is to use your Dutch nationality, get into Germany, make contact with the German crown prince, now the Kaiser's son, insinuate yourself into his confidence, and then relay that information back to us. She makes a contact with the German crown prince, decides pretty much that she needs to tell them that, look, the French want me to work as an agent for them. I didn't really want to do this. And the Germans argue, well, that makes it great because if the French think you're working for them, we can feed your information and now you're going to have to work for us. So what I basically see is a woman who is, who is caught in this situation where she's essentially obliged to become a double agent initially simply to accomplish her own personal goals. Eventually what happens is that she is arrested by the French, who now begin to catch on that she, you know, she didn't really supply any useful information. They begin to think that she's a double agent for the Germans. Then the French army soon after suffers uh, a disastrous defeat and mutinies. There's a political crisis in France. There has to be some reason for this, right? You know, anytime there's a military defeat and a crisis, somebody's got to be blamed. Who can we blame? I know, spies, spies, that's it. This is all part of a horrible German espionage plot, which this awful Dutch exotic dancer is all a part of. I mean, she made great newspaper coverage, and therefore she is accused of espionage. She is tried, convicted, tied to a stake, and shot, and then becomes a legend. She becomes the sort of poster girl for female secret agents ever after without, I really think, accomplishing anything of real espionage significance. In World War II, uh, it helped to be a woman, I think, um, in uh, the intelligence area because the Germans came from a very traditionalist patriarchal society in which women were confined to very specific roles as wives and mothers and you know that's the way they thought of them. If a young man was on a bicycle chances were good that he would be pulled over by uh, Germans but a young woman that wasn't true so they could be out in public as they were carrying arms or, you know, carrying a radio set or carrying documents. And the chances were very good that they could talk their way out of, you know, any encounter that they had with the Germans. The resistance movement in France was just like the society in France. It tended to be misogynistic. It was sexist. Um, so most of the leaders, almost all the leaders were men. And they really didn't want women that much to be involved in the resistance. I mean, their view was that men fought, men spied, men, you know, committed sabotage and women stayed home. Um, that was that was the way France was set up. But tens of thousands of women belonged to the French resistance. And they did all sorts of things. I mean, they collected intelligence, they transported arms, they uh, helped Allied servicemen escape. A number of them even committed sabotage against the Germans. But very little attention was paid to them, even though their jobs were just as dangerous and just as important as the men. So in World War II, in another war, you have more spies, you have more resistance organizations, which inevitably become combined with espionage because resistance organizations operate on the ground in occupied countries, and therefore they are your eyes and ears to collect information. A second group would be involved in sabotage, uh, blowing up trains, destroying ammunition depots, ambushing German patrols. And then there was yet a third group which would be involved in setting up escape lines primarily for downed Allied airmen. During World War II, um, the Office of Strategic Services used the services of Virginia Paul as a spy in uh, occupied France. First of all, she worked for the British, for the Special Operations Executive, and then for the OSS, working with the French resistance, engaging in operations often disguised as a uh, milkmaid or uh, an old woman, and uh, thereby escaping suspicion. 
and she was involved in operations that led to the capture of 500 German soldiers. A truly distinguished uh, American covert operative, and indeed she received the Distinguished Service uh, uh, Award at the end of the uh, end of the war. One of very few women to do so. Didi Zhang was the woman who created what was called the Comet Line, and it was the largest escape line in Western Europe. Her agents, most of them were young women, managed to get hundreds of young Allied pilots or other servicemen who had either been shot down or had been trapped behind enemy lines, escorted them across hundreds of miles to neutral Spain, and then they were taken back to England. And she was eventually caught. But she managed to survive the war because they didn't believe her. And she, she admitted that she, she, in fact, had created this network, but they refused to believe her. And she said after the war, she said, oh, Women have this innocent look, um, you know, uh, they just didn't believe that women had opinions or of their own or an ability to do what she did. The woman that I uh, think it was the most important woman in the French resistance um, was a young um, mother of two, whose name was Marie Madeleine Forcad, who was 31 years old when she became head of Alliance, which was the largest intelligence network in occupied France. She met this military intelligence officer whose name was Georges Lustenau Lecoq, who was actually a colleague of Charles de Gaulle's. And he created this private intelligence organization um, in the late 30s, which was basically collecting information about uh, the buildup of German military power. Um, she, and she became his deputy. They went to Vichy, which is where the collaborationist French government was based. And they set up this intelligence organization. In 1941, July of 1941, he was captured. She was his deputy. She took over um, the leadership, but did not tell MI6, who was supporting this organization financially and in other ways. They didn't find out for another six months that, in fact, a woman was leading the intelligence network that they most counted on to collect information. By the time they found out she was a woman, um, they were, they were upset because, you know, they, they were as sexist. MI6 was as sexist as, um, as the French. But they couldn't do anything about it because it was so successful that, okay, they had to accept the fact that it was run by a woman. And so she worked very, very closely uh, with MI6 for the rest of the war. Alliance had about 3,000 agents who were scattered all over France the largest organization in the country. And they were from all types of backgrounds. I mean, they were um, teachers, lawyers, uh, actors, uh, priests, uh, bus drivers, fishermen. Um, they came from everywhere. Um, but they all had uh, one goal, which is basically to get the Germans out of the country. In any uh, intelligence network, it's very important to have a sort of cell system um, so that um, only as many people as necessary know certain secrets, know the identity of other agents so that, you know, if they are, if the cell is penetrated, the damage is confined. Um, uh, and, and so intelligence, this, this is the cardinal principle of intelligence work, is, is that everything is done on, on a, on a need-to-know basis and mutual anonymity to the extent that's, uh, that, that is possible, and, and compartmentalization. Allianz got so big um, that um, she didn't know everybody in the organization, and that was one of the problems. Uh, it, 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 it had expanded so quickly. Um, that a number of people came into um, the group that were infiltrators. Most of the arrests um, of her agents were because of these infiltrators. 
course, it becomes dangerous when a network becomes too big because it's very difficult to preserve compartmentalization and that cell-like structure across uh, a really big range of people. The, 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 the chain of command becomes uh, fuzzier and you are sort of exponentially increasing uh, the risk of penetration and exposure and, uh, and detection. Marie Madeline was captured twice. The first time was in 1942, the next one was in 1944. She was incredibly good at evading capture. She would go from one little town to another, uh, you know, with the, with the Gestapo on her heels, and, and she would pick up in the middle of the night, having maybe spent two weeks in a town, and have to go on to another town, and, you know, always knowing uh, that that they were right behind her. She managed to stay ahead of them all the way into mid-1943. At that point, the British made her come to London because they were sure that she was going to be captured and once captured, she would be killed. So she stayed in London almost a year. She did not want to be in London. She wanted to be with her, um, the resistance, but they refused to let her go. They finally allowed her to return to France in July 1944, one month after D-Day. And she went to Aix-en-Provence in the south of France. And sure enough, two weeks later, she was captured. But they didn't know who she was. She was put in a military barracks jail cell in Aix. Um, to await the arrival of the head of G the Gestapo in Marseille. She knew what lay in store for her if, in fact, he came, and she was afraid that she would not be able to stand up to that torture. It's only human, uh, if, you know, if you're suffering great pain, to give in. And so she decided to um, look around and see if there's any possible way she could escape. And she remembered a story that her father told her having grown up in Shanghai, he told her about how Chinese bandits would oil themselves uh, before setting out on a robbing expedition so that they could slip through the bars of gates and windows to get into the homes they wanted to rob. It was July, it was very hot and sultry in the south of France. It was, and she was, so she was sweating and she was also sweating because she was terror stricken. She was terribly afraid. And so she thought that maybe she would try to imitate these robbers. So she investigated the bars on the cell. It was a window, there was no glass. It was open to the elements. And two bars were slightly wider than the rest of the bars. And so she decided to try. And she stripped nude and she took off all her clothes, put her dress in her teeth, but she managed to get her body through the bars. She jumped down, jumped into the street on all fours with the dress still in her teeth, crawled across the street, uh, got to the other side, uh, put on her dress, and managed to escape. Arguably, one of Marie Madeline's most important agents uh, was a, a young woman um, a, a, in her early 20s, and her name is Jeanne Rousseau. She was responsible for collecting information about the V1 and V2 terror weapons that Hitler hoped would win the war for Germany. And again, she used um, the stereotype uh, that Germans had about women to in her success. She had just graduated from uh, one of Paris's top universities when the war broke out. Uh, she was at the top of her class. She's brilliant. Uh, spoke five languages fluently, including uh, German. Eventually, she ended up in Paris, and she became the translator for a group of French industrialists who had business with the German military authorities in Paris. And so she translated into German and back into French. So she spent a lot of time with um, German military officers. Um, and they started asking her to come to social gatherings they had. Um, and among these officers were a group that clearly were working on something very secret. What she did was to be this cute young woman who would sit, listen, drink, 
and, and just be wide-eyed about what they were talking about. She learned an enormous amount about the V1 and V2s uh, from these young men who just thought she was, you know, she had, again, didn't have a brain in her head. And after each one of these social gatherings, she would leave and go to a safe house, an Aliot safe house in Paris. She had a photographic memory and she wrote down everything she had heard that night. So after a couple of weeks, several weeks, she had an enormous amount of material that was sent to London. And the day after it arrived, it was on Winston Churchill's desk. After the war, uh, Charles de Gaulle and his Free French uh, established this organization of the Order of Liberation. In this organization, in this honorary society, there were a little over 1,000 people, 1,038, I think. And so these were the heroes of France. Well, after the Second World War was over uh, and all the heroes were to be anointed, uh, de Gaulle, who was a major, not the sole political figure in, in France after that, set up a, a kind of legion for honor for those who had served in the resistance. The general criticism that they leveled is that it was a thoroughly politicized effort. Also, it tended to, the argument is, and I think fairly said, largely ignore the large contribution of female agents and assets to the wartime resistance movement. So there's 1,038. Of that, that number, 1,038, 1,032 were men, only six women were chosen, and Marie Madeleine Foucault was not one of them. Only men were in the resistance. Uh, only men played a, a, an important part in liberating their country when, in fact, uh, tens of thousands of women did the same, and they were never given the credit. Do people always get the recognition that they deserve? Of course not. Do people get recognition and fame and glory for things that aren't necessarily deserveable? Yes, that happens all the time. It's, you know, to me, the greatest spies probably are the ones that you've never heard of. The roles that women played throughout history, regardless, but certainly in terms of espionage, it is a loss um, to not know what they did. And basically, women have been forgotten. It's basically shutting out half of the human race in terms of the achievements that they were responsible for. They were forgotten because basically men have largely told the story of espionage or of World War II. It is a tremendous loss, but at least we're recovering, um, you know, we're uncovering and recovering. Uh, what these women did, and that's what's really important. The appreciation of the role which female agents played in, in both world wars and between the wars and after the wars in, in espionage is one of those areas of history that deserves more scrutiny because everything in history deserves more scrutiny. And it's simply about having a more accurate picture of, of what was going on. History of nothing else is like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. And you can't get a genuine picture of the human past or experience, which is all it's really about, unless you put all of those pieces into their particular positions. Nowadays, uh, women are very much the, the face of the CIA in TV shows such as Homeland or movies like Zero Dark Thirty. Women still lag behind in terms of uh, representation in the services and leadership positions in the services themselves. But nonetheless, you know, a, a, a number of women do now lead uh, U.S. intelligence agencies, most uh, recently and famously, of course, uh, the first woman director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Gina Haspel. As a female intelligence professional, I have to say that in the, you know, in the modern times, it's been immensely gratifying to see so many really outstanding women um, taking leadership roles in the intelligence community. I've worked with a lot of intelligence professionals, wonderful intelligence professionals, and I have to say that some of the best 
have been women, incredibly ethical, professional, capable officers. And some of the best managers have been women. They really have um, such an exemplary sense of judgment and have just, you know, led us through many, many crises. The world is at war. One by one, your allies are swallowed up by a monstrous enemy, and you fear your nation will be next. Only one friendly nation, protected by distance and bolstered by wealth, seems likely to escape the enemy onslaught. You have begged for their aid, but their leader and their people seem determined to stay neutral. You've exhausted all diplomatic options. What else would you do to persuade your ally to join the fight?